Praise the Lord, family. I said, praise the Lord, family. Come on and give God some praise. We are in the house of the Lord once again. Great is our God and greatly to be praised. Come on and give him some praise. Worship his holy name. God has spared us one more, one more, one more, one more time. And we are thankful to be here. We give God praise. We give him honor and we give him glory for allowing us to come to see another day in which we've not seen before to all of the people that are here, to the preachers and to our deacons and our musicians and choir members and audio video people, all of you, brothers, sisters in Christ. What a blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord once again. Amen. What a blessing. What a blessing. What a blessing. We want to uh, be mindful of several things. I want to acknowledge, because it's official now, we have a woman as the vice president of the United States, even though she's not fully in the position yet, but what a blessing that we are alive in a day and time when glass ceilings are being broken. And not to mention just a woman, but she's a sister, amen, and what a blessing it is to prepare ourselves for the um, upcoming uh, inauguration that will take place in January. Keep in mind, we're still in the midst of a lot of stuff going on around us, but we believe that God's will has been done, and he will administer and work out all of the details as we go forward. I want you to be mindful that on next week, many of you know, on next Saturday, we would have had our traditional harvest dinner. I was approached on yesterday, uh, Sister Sharon Shelton, who is the sister of Sister Karen Parks, uh, works with an organization who's going to donate 350 individual meals to Mount Sinai. Uh, I approved it on yesterday. Amen. So next Saturday, between 10.30 and 12, we will get the word out, but we're going to feed the homeless like we traditionally do. If you're interested in volunteering to participate, you need to get in touch with Sister Lydia, amen, because we still have to adhere to CDC standards and state standards, but there are a lot of people out there who are homeless and dejected at a time such as this, and uh, God has brought this dear sister in the Ujima Project of LA, they're the ones who are providing uh, the food. And then there's another company called Every Table who's actually putting it together and will have it delivered here to the church next Saturday morning. Uh, and we will give them out to the homeless that are here, the people in the neighborhood, uh, church members, etc. So if you're interested, reach out to Sister Lydia, let her know you'd like to volunteer. 10.30 to 12 noon next Saturday, at around 12.15, I'm going to leave. There's a bunch of homeless encampments on Lamita Boulevard between Vermont and Figueroa. Whatever's left, I'm going to go over there personally and give out food to them. Uh, and if there's any left after that, I'm going to the great city in which I was born, the city of Watts. And we're going to give out food over there. Amen. So you don't have to be involved in all that, but whatever you can do, we'd appreciate it if you'd sign up, help us out as we take care of those who are less fortunate than we are. I want to ask that you be mindful of the sick, the shut-in. We're praying for Mother Dorothy Clemens. We're praying for Sister Kathleen Overturf. Praying for Sister Evelyn Mitchell. Praying for Brother James Ridgeway and for Sister Talia White. Uh, I did get an update yesterday on uh, Sister Tempia Tut's daughter, Serena. Uh, has had surgery. She is doing well uh, and should be out of the hospital on Monday. So I'm asking that you all continue to pray for that family. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, how we thank and how we praise thee. How we bless thy holy name. We thank you, God, for being God all by yourself. That in spite of how we feel and in spite of what we think, you remind us, even today, as warm blood is flowing in our veins, 
that you still specialize in the blessing business. God, we honor thee today. We ask, Lord, that you would forgive us of our sinfulness. Anything that we've said, anything that we've done, manner in which we've behaved that is antithetical to your will, your way, your word, and your work. Forgive us right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you for another day on this side of the grave. We're praying, Lord God, for this country, for this world, as the pandemic continues to spread numbers in which we've not seen before throwing off people's plans for the holiday. God, but we thank you, you give us wisdom from on high. So we pray that we would operate with wisdom, that we would be mindful of the risk. We'd be mindful, Lord God, not just of us being infected, but the potential that we might infect someone else. God, we pray that you would bring unity in our country. We pray, Lord God, that we could get on one accord and on one page. Help us, Lord, as only you can, that we would put you back in all that we do, that you would be the center of our joy. Now, God, as we prepare for the word today, we pray, Lord God, that you would open our minds, open our hearts, pour into us that which you'd have us to have, have us to know, have us to be, have us to do. Let your word, Lord God, take root in good soil. Break up the fallow ground, Lord God, that we might receive a word from on high today. And when it's all said and done, we'll be careful to bless and to praise, to glorify and to celebrate your holy name. Now continue to have your way in this place. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let all the people of God say, amen. Come on and give God a hand praise. Stand and grab your Bibles. Stand and grab your Bibles. And I'd ask that you would draw your attention to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. You can't see them, but I'm honored that my grandsons, two of my grandsons, are here with me today. And uh, uh, it's interesting uh, at 56 dealing with young people. Amen. Amen. (laughs) But I love them, and uh, we're having a good time with them. And we got them down here at the church. Amen. Early this morning. They wanted to sleep in. I'm like, oh, no, you're going to church, brother. You're going to church. You're going to do what I do. You're going to do what grandma does. Amen. So we're thankful for them. Psalm 37, beginning at verse 1, these words are recorded. I'm reading from the King James Version of the Bible. Fret not thyself because of evil doers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shall thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. And finally, verse 4, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. From those four verses, I'd like to use for a focal point for a theme this morning, Crisis Management 101. Crisis Management 101. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Whether you know it or not, we are in the midst of a crisis. And because we're in the midst of a crisis, we need some added ammunition to help us maintain the mental fortitude and the spiritual wherewithal to make it through to the other side of this crisis. This psalm was written 
in the twilight of David's life. The man after God's own heart had been through many things and had experienced many events at the hand of God. This psalm deals with a perennial recurring and perpetual problem. A problem that has plagued and puzzled the people of God throughout the ages. How do we reconcile and account for the fact that the unruly, the boisterous, the disruptive, the ungovernable, from a distance, or so it appears, that they continue to prosper and the ungodly often face the greatest possible hardships. David perhaps had the book of Job in front of him as he pondered this problem. The story of Job shows us that there are factors in God's providential care which are unseen and unknown by mankind. And that in the end, there is a spiritual reckoning of sorts which occurs by way of the hand of God himself. But the end is sometimes so long coming. As a matter of fact, I dare say that sometimes the end does not even appear to come in our lifetime. And yet God is purposed and he's planned. And there's nothing that happens by accident or happenstance because God is sovereign and he's in control of everything. There are two other Psalms that wrestle with this same problem. Psalm 49 and Psalm 73. However, each of those Psalms address this problem from a different point of view. Psalm 49 emphasizes the sensitivity of the psalmist. In Psalm 49, we see the psalmist declares and gives perspective from a view that man's problems and issues in the big scheme of things are relatively light and it's not worth you concerning yourselves with the lesser things. As a matter of fact, Psalm 49 also gives us a perspective that don't worry about and chase after money and the things that money can buy. Psalm 73 has a different perspective. Psalm 49 deals with the sensitivity of the psalmist, but Psalm 73 emphasizes the suspicion of the psalmist due to the mere fact that the problem still remains. After they've prayed, after they've sought after God, after they've called upon his name, the problems and the issues seem to still be present. Unlike a Saturday evening movie where it appears that the worst things, the most catastrophic things can be dealt with usually in about an hour and a half, two hours, if you include commercials. Life is real, and sometimes we have to go through weeks and months and years of turmoil in order that God would lead us to the place that he'd have us to be. And if the truth be cold, because of my mental health and my stability is being challenged, I am in a position in which it becomes heavy on my heart, the things in which we see in the world today. Despondency and hopelessness are starting to settle in for the long stay. And then in the midst of it, we thought that this year would be the best year that we've had in many. For many of us, 2020 was supposed to be the comeback year. It was supposed to be the reboot year. It was supposed to be the rebound year. And then all of a sudden in the midst of that, 
in the midst of my advancement, in the midst of my promotion, in the midst of my progression, we are now stuck in the midst of a pandemic. And in the pandemic, we're bearing witness to an election which appears baseless and senseless, irrational to say the least. But the Spirit of the Lord spoke to my heart and said, tell my people that I have a plan. Before they throw in the towel, before they give up and fall by the wayside, before my people know all of this will be past us and will be on the other side. As a matter of fact, if my boy Biggie Smalls was here, he would say it was all a dream. It was all a dream. This is going to pass by the people of God and God has a plan and an escape for us. The question is, is how do you manage through crisis management 101 when everything is coming at you from every side? Not just the pandemic, not just the election. Your money is funny. Your change is strange. Not just those things, but your relationships are on the brink. If there are things that happen in our lives in which God allows them to take place in order to teach us some things and to lead us to some new places. Don't you know, as you go up the mountain of sanctification, sometimes you get comfortable. You get comfortable and God has to shake up some stuff in order for you to continue to move in the things of him. In Crisis 10 Management 101, there are some things that you and I have to be cognizant of, mindful of, in order that we would keep our mind and our spirit right in order to get to the other side. There's some things. And when you begin to think about them, when you begin to look at these verses before us that King David wrote, there are some things within these verses that give us a glimpse. It gives us an indication of what God believes and knows to be necessary for his people to keep moving. The first thing there is in verse 1 and 2. The first thing as you look at it is between verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass. M many of us believe not soon enough, but our soonness and God's soonness are different things because our thoughts are not his thoughts and our ways are not his ways. But the Bible says they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green Herb. Here's the first thing. In order to make it through the crisis in which we face, here's the first thing that I would give you in Crisis Management 101. You have to have discernment. The discernment. Dis discernment because it is a word that is often used in the church, but many people don't understand it and how to use it in order to benefit and bless them and ultimately glorify our Father. The word fret appears in the psalm three times. It appears in verse 1, it appears in verse 7, and it appears in verse 8. The word in the Hebrew, kara, means to burn, to be kindled, to glow. In other words, it means to be angry. Figuratively, it means to get angry and become vexed in your spirit. How can you serve God and praise him and give God your best when you're angry and vexed in your spirit? Anger has a way of shifting our perspective and our outlook. Anger has a way of controlling our thoughts and our behaviors. We're not talking about a little irritation or momentary frustration. We're talking about something that kindles over time. And a fire that kindles can ignite 
of forest fire. This word indicates an anger that is consuming. This word indicates an anger that is overwhelming. This word consists of uh, the word anger that is incontrollable. One moment of anger has caused some people to spend a lifetime in prison. One moment of anger has destroyed what otherwise would have been a good marriage. One moment of anger has decimated lifelong friendships. Some people will attempt to justify their behavior of anger in that it is directed toward those who are evil doers. But the Bible tells us vengeance is mine, said the Lord. I will repay. You know what that means? That means that there's no reason for me to get angry because of how people deal with me or act around me because my God said that vengeance is mine. And what I know about God, God is a righteous judge. There are times when our perspective can be wrong. There are times when you can judge somebody critically for something they've done or said and you can be off base. But my God knows how to deal. Well, how do you know, preacher? Because the Bible tells me in Genesis chapter 39 that there was a brother by the name of Potiphar. The Bible said Joseph was his servant in his home, and the Bible says Potiphar's wife took a liking to Joseph. Joseph was handsome. He was cute. He was tall. He was all that and then some. And the Bible says says she tried to sleep with brother Joseph and the Bible said he refused her advances and one day when Potiphar got back home to his house the Bible says that his wife accused Joseph of trying to rape her. The Bible says Potiphar was angry. The Bible says Potiphar's wrath kindled in him but the fact of the matter is if the truth be told Joseph had not done anything wrong and yet Potiphar was angry enough to sentence him to prison. Don't you know that there are some people it may appear that they've done you wrong but the fact of the matter is they were just trying to help you. They were trying to give you some advice. They were trying to hold you accountable. They were trying to help you get on the right track. But the Bible says to fret not thyself at evil doers neither be thou envious of the workers of iniquity is there anybody in here that can declare they may have more than what I have but I got God on my side is there anybody in here that can declare they may drive nicer cars but I got God on my side is there anybody in here that can say they may have more money in the bank but I got God on my side and as long as I got God on my side I have everything point to somebody and tell them use your discernment use your discernment use your discernment if you're going to make it through this crisis you need discernment you, you, you need to be able to decipher something that may look one way but it's really something different you have to be able to understand what God is doing behind the scene. Don't look at the people in the story. Look at the God behind the story. And God's way is always the best way. And God's will shall be done. Crisis management. 101. The first thing in order for us to get through this crisis, this current crisis that we're facing, no matter what it is, health issues, marital problems, problems with your children, problems on your job, you have to have discernment to be able to see past the issue and know that God is working something out for your benefit, for your blessing. God, when I come through this, I'm going to be stronger than I've ever been before. 
God, when I get past this, I'm going to be more appreciative than I've ever been before. God, when I get back to church, I'm going to praise you and worship you and act out, God, just to be back into the house of prayer. There's something about having discernment to understand that God has a plan. And no matter what you're dealing with, I'm telling you, it's working for your good. It's working for your benefit. There is a blessing behind it all. The question is, can you exercise discernment until God brings you out? Discernment. 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 But not only do we need discernment to make it through this current crisis, the other thing we need is we need decisiveness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Bible says, trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Wow, decisiveness. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. In order to make it through a crisis, you have to have some decisiveness. There has to be something in your mind that is so concretized as it pertains to trusting God that you're able to have the wherewithal and the staying power to stand strong even in the midst of the hurricane. The waters are overtaking you. The winds are mighty. The earthquake is shaking you and throwing you around but as soon as you fall you're able to jump right back on your feet knowing that I trust my God and God has not brought me this far to leave me to throw me by the wayside to allow the enemy to take over and to dominate my life the Bible says that when the enemy comes in like a flood God will raise up a stand against him. Don't you know that if the enemy had his way, your marriage would be over? Don't you know that if the enemy had his way, you'd have fall off by the wayside crying and weeping because your health was failing you? Don't you know that if the enemy had his way, he'd have took your mind, he'd have took your joy, he'd have took your hope, he'd have took your peace, but the devil is a liar. The Bible the Bible says, trust in the Lord and do good. The Bible does not say do good and trust in the Lord because you have to trust him in order to do good. Is there anybody that realizes the more I trust him, the more I walk with him. The more I trust him, the more I listen to him. The more I trust him, the more he speaks to me. The more I trust him, the more he leads me, guides me directs me. The more I trust him, the more I love my wife. The more I trust him, the more I love my husband. The more I trust him, the more I deal better with my kids. The more I trust him, the better I am on my job. Is there anybody? Is there anybody? Is there anybody listening? Is there anybody in the house of God that can say, I'm going to trust God. I am decided to trust him and to follow him. That requires Decisiveness. Yeah, I, I need some decisiveness. I, I have to learn how to trust God. Decisiveness is the quality of being strong-minded and resolute. It is operating and maneuvering and moving with great certainty and conclusiveness. David knew what he was talking about when he said, trust in the Lord and do good, so shall thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. You remember David was on the run from Saul. 
He was on the run for years from King Saul. King Saul was jealous of David and wanted to kill David. But guess what? As long as David was on the run, God provided for him. He fed him. He protected him. He led him, guided him in the path of righteousness for his own namesake. Don't you know that in spite of all that's going on, around you, you ain't missed a meal yet. Don't you know that in spite of all that's going on around you, you still had shelter over your head? Don't you know in spite of all that's going on around you, you still had a soft place to lay your head? Don't you know in spite of all that's going on around you, you still got warm blood flowing through your veins? Your mind is still regulating your clothes in your right mind. Is there anybody that can declare you're not ashamed of the fact you're not apologetic about it, but God has kept you in spite of all that's going on? Decisiveness. There are some people who decide to follow God, but as soon as the storms of life arise, They have a way of drifting away from God. They believe that God has sold them a bill of goods. They believe that God has not been kind and that he's not been faithful to his word. But we stop by to tell you in spite of what you think, we walk by faith and not by sight. And the same God that we have always worshipped is still sitting on the throne. The Bible says now faith is the substance of things hoped for, but the evidence of things not seen. In other words, it's intangible, invisible, and intouchable, but it's still faith. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, that they that come to God must come to him by faith, knowing that he is and that he's a reward water of those who diligently seek him. I don't know about you, but in my times of storm, I have to seek out God and know that God has not left me. He's still there whispering in to my spirit. Is there anybody who finds comfort in knowing in the midnight hour God is always available to you? Is there anybody who realizes in the early morning God is always available to you? Is there anybody that can trust the Lord and keep doing good because you know God has brought you further than anybody else could ever imagine? That God took you over the mountain and God took you through the valley and God healed your body and restored your faith and restored your soul and snatched you from the clutches of the enemy. I am decided to follow him. If I'm going to get through this crisis, I have to have some decisiveness. God, I'm going to stick it out. God, you're going to work it out. God, I'm not going to lose my mind. I'm not going to leave my wife. I'm not going to forsake my kids. God, even if you take the cars, if you take the house, God, I'll still be able to get around because I ain't always had a fancy car and I ain't always had a big house. But even then, you made a way out of no way. You were still the bridge over the trouble, tumultuous water. God, you brought me through some stuff that if I began to even testify about it, I would lose control of who I am and I'd forget where I am and begin to worship you like never before. Is there anybody that's ever been through anything that God has brought you through? And he said, if I did all that, you ought to be able to trust me now. The Bible says, trust in the Lord and do good. That is what's called a cause and an effect. You cannot do good, not to God's standards, if you do not trust him. 
You have to trust God in order to do good. And then he says, and then you're going to dwell in the land and you're going to be fed. You may not be able to eat at the fancy restaurants you used to, but God can put something on the table that can satisfy your stomach and satisfy your craving. That is the God that we serve. The problem that we have, family, is people are spoiled and they believe that God is just supposed to give them everything they want, not realizing that if God is still making a way, that means he's still being honest and truthful to his word. That means that just when you come to the end of your road, just when you come to the point you're ready to throw in the towel, I dare you, I double dare you to just speak into the spirit and say, God, I trust you and I'm not going to quit. God, I'm not going to quit because you've been too good to me. God, I'm not going to quit because I believe in your word. What a shame it is that in the body of Christ, we have so many quitters in the pulpit, so many quitters in the pews, so many quitters in the choir, saying so many quitters on the usher board, but the devil's lying. We're not quitting. We're going to continue to move forward in the things of God and after after he's tried me, I'm going to come forth as pure gold because the God I serve is going to work it out and lead me through the crisis. One of the things I love about GPS is that you can program GPS and say, give me the fastest route. Sometimes the fastest route it's not always the best route. I've learned that sometimes the fastest route takes me off the freeway and takes me through 10 different neighborhoods. I, I don't want to go sightseeing in other people's neighborhoods. So sometimes I would rather take an extra five or 10 minutes, but at least be familiar with the route that I'm taking. Don't you know that the God that we serve can lead us? You may not be familiar with the surroundings, but God still knows how to get you to where he wants you to be. The question is, can you exhibit, can you apply some decisiveness in order to get there? We're going to get through this thing one way or another. You can come through with your mind clear, and your faith strong, or you can limp over the finish line. Some of us are gonna be walking straight up, some of us are gonna be running, and guess what? Some of us is meant for us to crawl through or to limp by. But that's God's design and God's plan. That ain't your plan. For you, maybe it is that God wants you not only to stand up straight, but to drag a couple of folk with you when you go past the finish line. you got to stay strong in your mind and strong in your spirit in order for God to lead you through this thing. Crisis management 101. The first thing that you need is you need some discernment. You need to be able to see past all the foolishness. Don't be jealous about what people got and you don't have. You don't know what they went through. You don't know who they destroyed to get that stuff. You don't know who they stepped on, who they betrayed, who they lied on and lied to to get that. Sometimes... It's better to just wait on God's time and know that God's still going to provide for me. Discernment. But not only discernment, you need some decisiveness. Trust in the Lord and do good. Don't just trust in the Lord and don't do nothing. What's the purpose of trusting in him if I'm not going to do good? If I'm not going to impact somebody? Yesterday, it's going to be hectic next Saturday feeding people because it's such a last-minute thing. But I don't care if it's just me and my wife. We're going to hand out food. And we're going to hand it out as long as there's lines and as long as there's food to give out. We'll be here. Because when you trust in the Lord, 
you cannot help but do good. Decisiveness. But then here's the last one, family, and we're done. The Bible says in verse 4, delight thyself in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Not only do you need some discernment, not only do you need some decisiveness, First Lady Kim, you need some determination. Yeah, 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 let's put the, the rubber on the road here. We, we need some determination. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. The Bible does not say try to delight thyself in the Lord. Hmm. It says delight thyself. That is a command. That is a commission to delight thyself in the Lord. The word translated delight comes from a root word that means to be brought up in luxury and to be pampered. Mm, listen to me. It speaks of the abundance of the blessings we have in the God that we serve. Totally apart from what he gives us, it's because of our relationship with him. To enjoy the blessings and ignore the blesser is to practice idolatry. In Jesus Christ, we have all of God's treasures and we need no other. If the truth be told, to delight thyself in the Lord ought to be the chief desire of every believer. Anyone who's ever come in contact with God has never left him in the same way. He has a way of changing your perspective. He has a way of uplifting your spirit. He has a way of changing your continence. He has a way of giving you the stick to to keep on pushing even in the midst of your storms. To delight thyself in the Lord is to remember that God has blessed me and I'm going to deal with him in a way where I pamper and love on him because of who he is. It is not because of what God has given me because if God never blessed me again, he's already given me enough. Is there anybody who realizes what your life was like before God stepped in and lifted you from the muck and the mire? If he never gave me the car and never gave me the house and never gave me the business, the fact that he saved my soul when I was on my way to a burning hell is enough for me to pamper him, to love on him, and to be show my intimate relationship with God. God is the one that you want to kiss on the neck. God is the one you want to hug in the midnight hour. God is the one you want to tell, I love you. I love you, Lord. I love you. I can't help but love you. God is the one that you want to be in love with more than you in love with anybody else. Because the more I delight in God, guess what God does? God gives me the desires of my heart. Listen to me right here. It's important that you understand that this does not mean that God is the genie in the bottle. God is not your spiritual Santa Claus because the more I delight in God, the more he changes my heart. That means the things that I desire are not the things of the world. That means the things that I desire are not the things that tempt me from the devil. That means the things that I desire are not things that man would applaud, but I want joy. I want peace from God. I want hope for him. I want to get up in the morning and know I can praise God for all that God has done for me. The fact that he woke me up this morning, the fact that my mind is regulated, the fact that I have use of my extremity is a reason to say thank you, Lord. You gave me the 
desires of my heart. Well, how do you know? Because last night when I laid down to sleep, I had my day already planned out. But God saw fit that I was able to wake up this morning. Don't you know it was not by your strength? Don't you know it was not by your spirit? But God is the one who allowed you to get up. You ought to tell somebody when you go back home today, God bless me to see another day. A day I had never seen before. A day I'm not deserving to see. But God said that he'd give it to me anyway. Don't you know that you have to learn how to be content in whatever situation you find yourself. That means that God is giving you the desires of your heart. It's not about stuff. People think, well, if God's going to give me the desire, I want a car. I want a new house. I want to take a nice trip. I want some money in the bank. That's not what he's talking about. The desires of your heart ought to be to get closer to God. It's to feel his presence and to know when he's speaking in your spirit. It's to know that in spite of all the foolishness I've done, in spite of all the stuff that I walked away from that I should have been doing, all the stuff I ran to that I should have never been involved in, God loved me anyway. Loved me through my good, loved me through my bad, loved me through my ups, Love me through my downs. Love me when I went left. He loved me when I was right. Because I delight myself in him. I'm going to love him in spite of the crisis. In spite of the election foolishness spite of the pandemic. I'm going to love him because God first loved me. Before the songwriter ever wrote the song, Oh, How I Love Jesus, God's love was already moving in the progressive participle because his word says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. If you're going to make it through this crisis, you need some elements of crisis management 101. You need some discernment. Now, a lot of people of the kingdom say they have discernment, and they don't. They're talking about worldly intuition. I'm talking about spiritual discernment. When you know that you know that you know that God is leading you through this process, fret not thyself at evildoers. I don't care what they do. I passed by Trump rally and I just, no sense to me, they, they have a right to, to rally and to, to cheer the same way we do. I don't care what people are doing in the world. I care what God is doing in the world. Fret not thyself at evildoers. Neither be thou envious workers of iniquity. I don't care how much money they have. God has supplied all of my needs according to his riches and glory. Discernment. But then you need some decisiveness. Trust in the Lord and do good so thou might dwell in the land and be Fed. I have to be decisive in my trusting of God. 
Because if the truth be told, there are things that pop up in the course of a day, in the course of a week, that will cause you to doubt God if you let it. But I'm going to trust him. I'm going to trust him. God, you've never failed me, never lied to me, never misled me, never tried to manipulate me or take advantage of me. So, God, I'm going to trust you. I believe you're going to bring me through this situation. And if the truth be told, God, even in the midst of all the hecticness, you're still providing for me. I'm still sleeping. I'm still eating. I still got folk around me I love that love me. May not be able to go and do everything I want to do, but God, I'm thankful for that which I can do. Trust in the Lord. But then finally, the Bible says in verse 4, delight thyself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. Sometimes we can be so ungrateful because we want things done a certain way. And we have expectations of God. And because he doesn't make it happen when you want it to happen, you begin to think, well, no sense in me praising him. No sense in me glorifying him. Because it appears he's not even coming through the way I need him. I want him to. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, we're done. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Even when God don't bless you materially, he's already blessed you spiritually with all heavenly blessings. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He, he, he's already given you everything you need to be successful spiritually. Crisis Management 101. And I don't want to speak for you, but I'm going to speak for me. I'm coming out of this thing. I'm coming through this thing. And I'm telling you, I'm going to be better than I've ever been in my life. I'm going to have more fortitude, more wherewithal. I'm spending so much time with God now that he is revealing things to me that I didn't even know existed in his word, in his purpose, or his plan. And I'm telling you, I'm not the only one. There are other folk that are determined. We're going to come through this thing. We're going to come through. We may not come through unscathed. We may not come through not being bruised or a little bit beaten. But guess what? As long as I make it to the other side with my God, I'm going to praise him and glorify his holy name in spite of all that the enemy has thrown my way. God has still kept me. He still kept me. I said, he still kept me. He still kept me. Eight months ago, I could have lost my mind. But God still kept me. He still kept me propped up. He held me up when it looked like I was going to fall down. God has made a way out of no way. But if you're listening today and you don't know Jesus, Crisis Management 101, the first thing you have to do is accept him as Lord and Savior of your life. It means nothing to attempt to apply these things, these principles, these doctrines and values to your life if you leave out the most critical aspect of it. And that is to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. Pray with us today. God, how we bless Thee. How we thank Thee, Lord, for Your blessings, for Your covering, for Your grace, Your mercy that endure to all generations. God, You have brought us further and faster than anything we could ever imagine. You have kept us with right mind, sound in our bodies, Lord God. 
blessed in our spirits. God, you have done so much for us. Words cannot even begin to tell. But God, there's somebody watching us today, someone listening to us today, who does not know you in the pardon of their sins. And I'm telling them today, Lord God, as you are my witness, that once you invite Jesus in your life, your life will never, ever be the same. God, I pray that the word today has piqued their curiosity. I pray that the word today has made its way through the fallow ground of their heart. I pray that the word today, Lord God, has not been snatched from them by the enemy, that the seed of the word has found a good resting place in their heart. And they're desiring, even at this moment, they're inquiring within themselves, what must I do to be saved? God, I pray that they would confess before you that Jesus Christ is Lord that they would confess before you and believe that you have raised him from the dead. And if they believe that with their whole heart, if they confess the fact that they're sinners, if they confess the fact, Lord God, there's no other hope for them but Jesus, we believe today that they will be saved. Now, God, touch the hearts and the minds of your people, Lord God, as we continue to struggle through, as we continue to make our way through, maneuver through, all of the crisis in which we find ourselves. God, we profess and proclaim your goodness and your kindness still reigns heavy on the lives of your people. We say thank you today for being God all by yourself. We ask these and all blessings in Jesus, our Savior's name. Let all the people of God say amen. Come on and give God some praise. I said, come on and give God some praise. Amen, 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 amen. We thank God, we thank God. We thank God. Don't forget, if you're interested in helping next week on Saturday, we ask that you reach out to Sister Lydia Haley, sign up. We are going to be adhering to CDC standards, so if you don't have a mask, we're going to give you one when you get here. We'll try to get some gloves, but we're going to be prepared to serve the people uh, in a very kind and considerate way and pray for them that God would bless them and continue to cover them. If you're interested in helping, don't have to. It's voluntary only. Uh, we ask that you uh, be here next week around 10 o'clock, uh, and we'll start serving around 1030. Amen? Listen to all of our family and friends that's listening from abroad. We appreciate you. Thank God for you. Those of you who are in other states and other countries, uh, we cannot begin to express to you how grateful we are that you continue to tune into this small church in San Pedro, California. We appreciate you and thank God for you. Listen, we want to hear from you. Reach out to us. Go on to the website. Send us an email. Let us know how you're doing. Let us know how God is moving in your life. Uh, and we will continue to pray for you. We ask that you pray for us. Listen, family, don't forget in this 2020 experience, in all of your being, in all of your doing, and in all of your getting, God will be glorified. God bless you. Hello, family. It's Pastor Thomas. And First Lady Kim. I want to thank you for tuning in today, and I pray that the Word of God has touched your heart and met you at your point of need. We appreciate the time that you took to tune in to our service today. Also, to those of you who are part of the Mount Sinai family, words cannot begin to express how much we appreciate you, how much we love you, and more importantly, how much we miss you. To those who are listening in other states and other countries, we thank God for your presence. We thank God for your believing in this small church in San Pedro, California. And we pray that you don't let this opportunity to tune into the service to take the place of real ministry where you can go and be involved in a church that's doing kingdom building where you live at, where you're located. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram for the podcast, live stream, and for any church announcements. One other thing, family, before we go, listen to those of you who've been given into the kingdom. We appreciate your support. We appreciate your financial commitment to the church. Don't forget, family, we have an obligation to support the ministry. And for many of you, you've done that and you've done it well. We've not missed a beat in the last four months. But for those of you who've not been as committed, I pray that God would inspire and touch your heart, that you would also continue in your obligation. Listen, family, don't forget in this 2020 experience, in all of your being, in all of your doing, and in all of your getting, God will be glorified. God bless you, family.